And Moses wants to go. He said, no, don't come. I'm God. I'm holy. Take out your shoes. Take your shoes. You know your shoes? What is the meaning of your shoes? Take everything on you. It's dirty. Take it. All kind of sin, all kind of things you are doing before coming in front of me. Let's live that holy life. And we know that our God is power and holy. Can we just clap for Jesus this morning? Can we just clap for God this morning? He's holy, 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 holy. Holy is your name. Hallelujah. We worship the great and power God. He become holy when he died on the cross for us. He become holy when he died on the cross for you and me to give us life. To give us life. He's holy. Can we just stand up together? I don't know what you want to tell him this morning, but can you say something? Praise him. Praise his holy name. Praise his holy name. Thank you, holy name. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. You are holy. Holy is your name. We glorify your name. We glorify your name. We give you all the glory, all the power, all the praise, and all the honor. Take control, God. Have your way, Holy Spirit, and make us be holy like you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Am I on? There we go. So if you're just wondering... God is holy, Moses took off his sandals, but we're not going to start a policy where everyone has to take their shoes off. Don't worry. <laughs> I don't know if I want to be in a building with a lot of people on a rainy day with wet socks and shoes with all of them off. I, I just don't know if I want that. So, Something else, though, this morning, too, I just wanted to share with you that really kind of was sitting on my mind, just kind of a fun little vision this morning. Was So this morning, when... I got my son up. We had you know, just kind of a slow morning, late night. Got him up, and he just wanted to crawl up in bed next to mom and just snuggle in. And I just remember being a kid, too, and how fun that was. Just, just on a rainy, gloomy day where, you know, we were farmers, so those type of days we didn't have as much to do. So how much fun it would be to, like, crawl up in bed and just snuggle in with your parents or your family crawl together. And that just kind of put a little picture in my mind this morning of, Jesus calling God Father. And just put a little picture of we're supposed to like talk to him as our Father. And just scripturally, there's no like theological evidence that God is up in a bed and we can actually crawl up and snuggle with him in bed. But just the mental picture of we should look at God that way sometimes. On this rainy day, it's easy to get up and say, oh, I just want to curl up, watch a movie or something like that. But just imagine yourself sometimes, and this is what it was playing in my mind, of just cuddling up with God, just snuggling in and, and just talking to him, being by him. And how that plays out, what you're doing, I don't know. But just kind of imagine that for yourself. And at some point, maybe in the next week, maybe later today, just imagine yourself snuggling in with God and get, get close, get emotional, so to speak, with him. Get, you know, pray, tell him what's on your heart. Just like as kids, we would find so much fun to just be right there with our parents in that bed because it was safe, it was warm, it was fun. That's how we should look at God, not just like, oh, we have to go to church on a rainy day and we're going to get wet. And maybe none of you thought that, but, but it's just like, just the picture, we come here, we can snuggle up to God or at home and get out your word. It's not just reading a history book, it's snuggling up to God and getting close with them. And I just, that was playing in my mind and I really wanted to share that with you this morning. Really wanted to share that with you this morning. I'm going to set something down there. <clears throat> All right, we do have an announcement that I want to have if we can throw it up there. So this is the next summer thing, Summer Nights Connect Church, mini golf at Tabor's July 27th. That would be next Tuesday, I believe, off the top of my head. So not as in two days from now, but as in two days and then a week. So it's a fun time. We've done it in the past. We just meet together. And miniature golf, I don't think it's real expensive. I think usually it's 5 to $7, something like that, for a person, or 7 I think I'm getting hands. So it's just, we get together and have fun. Play, do something outside, play some miniature golf, talk, that kind of stuff. Have, have a good time. And just, so these nice social events. So 
I just want to encourage everyone to go to that. I'm planning on it. Hopefully we don't have like rain like this, because rain like this would prevent miniature golf, but we need rain, but I hope we have a nice time and get together and do some miniature golfing. So, all right, that's it for announcements, and I want to get into the Word this morning. I want to get into this message, so if you want to pull, throw up the slide, let's go. So, just to introduce myself again, let's see if I'm at the right. My name is Theo. For anyone who is new or do, does not know, I think I'm on the right page. There we go. The seven churches of Revelation. This is week four, the church of, uh, in Thyatira. So we'll just pick right up in Scripture in Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. We'll read this and get going. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him, to Jesus, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. So right there, we've read that every week, so if you've been here every week, if it's getting boring, I'm sorry, but it's super, super important, so I want to read it every single week. This is the beginning of the book of Revelation, which if you don't know much about the book of Revelation, most of it deals with end time stuff. But the first couple chapters of this book actually deal with these seven churches, And not just with the seven churches, because it's in the Bible. It's in there for a reason, specifically for us to be able to read and learn it as well. So not only is it for the seven churches, but it is for us, for us, for our church. And so we can use this to read, to see what Jesus is saying to them, and look at how that applies to us as well. So this introduction, this is what we just read, was the introduction to this book of Revelations, or this letter at the time. And it starts off, it says, to the seven churches. So these seven churches, we've, we've covered a few of them in the last few weeks. We'll cover some more in the future weeks. But these seven churches are in what we would now call Turkey. At the time, they called it Asia because that was the province of Rome. But they're in that region. And so this introduction starts off, if we were to reread it and really break it all down, I don't want to do that again this morning, but it's coming from the three persons of God. It's one of the good spots in the Bible where we see the image of the Trinity. So it says, because it's who was, who is to come, that, and, and the seven, the Spirit, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit there, and then from Jesus, the faithful witness. And Jesus, the faithful witness, is a key part of this too, is really addressing the connection of God to, from God, Jesus to us, if that makes sense. There's God, Jesus is in between us, basically bringing us together, bringing the word to us and our word up to God, the faithful witness. And in that, it also says Jesus needs to be given the glory forever. The glory forever. And at the end of that little introduction, God once again says, The I am, I am, the I am, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and the Almighty. And so why it's really important that we read this every single week is simply to address that this is who these words are coming from. Because if we read the book of Revelation, if we were to read the entire book this morning, there are large chunks of it that sound really uh, depressing, down, not good, scary, that kind of thing, but it all comes at the after point of us acknowledging who God is and knowing our place with God, knowing his love for us and his care for us and how he views us. 
Because without that, yeah, if we pick up, pick up the book of Revelation, even these seven churches, they are, they're really kind of rough to get through because it feels like, can feel like a lot of uh, condemning, condemnation from God, but it's not that because it starts off with addressing how God actually views us how God views us with Jesus, our faithful witness, who made us priests, gave us a kingdom, brought us into his family. And when we view that first, when we have that view, then we can read this other stuff and see Jesus in there. We can see Jesus in those things. We can see God in all this situation. It's not just doom and gloom. So that's why we want to, I want to read that every single week when, before we get into this. And so after that, after we got into the series and into these seven churches, I'm not, we're going to do a little recap on them. The first week we had talked about the church in Ephesus. The church in Ephesus. And just as a quick little bring it back so we're not here forever, the big focus point that God talked to this church about was about their love. That they had lost their first love and he was calling them back to that. He was calling them back to that, saying, you, you doing, you're doing works, you're doing this other stuff, but you forgot your first love. And what he was talking about is your love for me, your love for Jesus, your love for your brothers and sisters in Christ. That love that comes only from me, you've forgotten that. You're just doing stuff. And so that first week with the church of Ephesus, we were focusing on love. And if you want to go back and read it, it's really good, but there's also, a, I'm going to warn you if you go back and read if you missed it, it pretty much flat out says, Jesus is saying to that church, if you don't go back to love, there's no point in you being a church. There's no point in you being a church because the point of the church is to love me, love one another, and share my love with the world. That's the point of a church. And so that was the first thing that we looked at. He wasn't saying there's no point in you believing me and your individuals, but as a church. So that was what was important. The second week of this series, we had read about the church in Smyrna and Philadelphia. In both of those churches, God or Jesus talked to them about their enduring faith, their faith that they were going through so much and that they would not back down from their belief in Jesus. They would not back down. And they were so strong in their faith that those churches didn't get a condemnation. They didn't get rebuked anything. They did, Jesus didn't say, oh, but you guys are messing this up and you got to look at this and evaluate. He just said, no, just keep going. You're doing great. You have your faith in me and you're just following that and you're making your decisions based off of that. So keep it up. Keep up that good work. So we kind of see this picture going of love and then faith. And then last week we read about Pergamum. We read about Pergamum, and one of the things that Jesus talked to them about was the teaching that was going on in that, that city. What was being taught, what was going on. And they were doing some good stuff, they were faithful in some areas, but he called them out on some of this teaching. That they were basically, that they were allowing stumbling blocks to be getting put in front of them. That were going to trip them up, that they were losing the faith, not the faith, but losing their vision based off of what they were listening to. They were listening to little words and little things being added in. He talked about Balaam in the Old Testament had taught the stumbling block, way, the ways of the stumbling block to the kings that wanted to defeat Israel. And he warned them, this is what's going on in the church. You're allowing these stumbling blocks by not being dedicated to the word and you're just tripping up, you're kind of, you're slowly, slowly slipping away. Go back to what you know. And that brings us to this week. That brings us to this week with the, the church that we're going to read about this week. And each one of these churches, if you're not actually in the word, basically there's a short paragraph-like edict letter to each one of these churches. And that's what we're going to focus on this morning, this one to Thyatira. So if you want to throw up the scripture in Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29, we're going to read this and then we're going to break it down and have to, hopefully God will give us a revelation from it. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished or burnished bronze. Sorry, there we go. And no, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance. 
and that your latter works exceeded the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her ways and immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches, all of the churches will know that I am he who searches the mind and heart. And I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on, in you, lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and the one who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations." and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, so that, that's the passage, and there's a, lot, there's a lot in there. But before we really start breaking down that scripture, I want to kind of give you a little reference some information on this actual city where this church is located because if we if you do the history study of all these churches the way jesus talks to them is very dependent on what these people are actually going through in their lives where they live what they see how they interact with others and so this city of thyatira is there's a modern city like xr xr or something i can't quite say it i don't have the phonetic pronunciation for it that's located there so this place isn't like a desolate just there's a ruin there are some ruins there there are some you know archaeological sites there but there's a city there there's still a city there it's somewhat important this city compared to some of these other cities that we've talked about in the last couple of weeks like ephesus smyrna these cities were on the coast they had harbors big trading hubs in that sense uh, pergamum was up on this like elevated kind of bluff mountain that could see over this big plain area. So they had like these significant reasons of their um, power, basically. But Thyatira is in a flat area, 40-some miles inland, just kind of along some trade routes. And as a city, it was politically and culturally marginalized at the time. It, wasn't, it was no super, super huge hub or other things, other than it found its identity in economics, in economy, because essentially it was able to kind of divert a lot of the roads through it. So if you're going from the cities like a Pergamum to Ephesus or to some down to where Philadelphia would have been, a lot of these other cities, they all kind of had to crisscross through there. They had to crisscross through the city. So it was kind of money-based. But the unique thing about it and what they have found in history and by studying, doing these digs, and they can actually, you could go to the ruins there and see this in the carvings and the writings, is that there is evidence that this city had a lot of guilds. Guilds. And guilds isn't exactly a term that we use nowadays a whole lot. So to explain, a guild is essentially a combination of a union and a university. So the guilds, so in this city they have evidence of guilds for bakers, bronze smiths, wool workers, potters, linen weavers, and tanners. Those that they know all had guilds there. So imagine you wanted to go into one of those trades and you could kind of just pick it up on your own. You could just start making pots or and you or you could sell stuff. You could go to a market, sell it or you could get, become part of this guild where you're going to get trained professionally. You're going to have the financial backing and the power of this guild. So all of a sudden, oh, you're certified by this guild. That quality is, has like a special marking. Your prices go up. 
You can, the guild will kind of control, kind of think a little bit mafia-ish and saying, okay, we don't want anyone that's not part of our guild doing any business in this region, so it's all going to go through us. So there was power there. That's where the power was. But that also meant that these trades, these trades had a lot of people, that's how they viewed a lot of the world. They had, would have been doing stuff there. So bronze smiths, there's probably a training center, high quality bronze work coming out of here. Baking, this, this isn't like I went and baked you a cake. This is like you went to a professional cake baker to make you your wedding cake, not Theo making your wedding cake. That's kind of the difference here. This is, you know, these other people, even to the point where if you go into Acts chapter 16, Paul converts a lady named Lydia from there who was a lady that dyed wool or cloth and stuff purple, which was a wealthier royal color. It's not like you're common, but if she was probably a part of one of these guilds, probably had some money and influence tied to that a little bit. So that was this culture. That's how they kind of viewed the world. They weren't going to be some military center. They weren't going to be some, you know, super, like they weren't known for their temples in the sense of like Pergamum or these other Roman capitals had, but they knew this trade. They knew these industries. That's how they viewed. That's how they gained their power. That's what this, this city was. And so when Jesus first introduces himself here, and it says, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze, that's kind of a reference. He's presenting himself in a way that they know. I mean, eyes like fire, they were skilled with fire. If these guys were bronze working, they had furnaces. They, you know, the furnaces, they were melting bronze, shaping bronze, reheating it, doing this kind of stuff. They would have been using fire for baking and these other potting, pottery, doing some of the glaze, these things. They Fire, they understood this. Bronze, they understood these references. So Jesus is presenting himself in a way that they're going to understand. It has a cultural reference, and so we, when we read it, we need to look at it. So it invokes these images familiar with their metal workers. And it also kind of points a picture that his feet have the ability to crush his enemies. If you look through the importance of what the feet image of a lot of these emperors and the other these people means the power, because they would be able to trample out. So this is a city that doesn't have power, really, and he's saying, but Jesus is this person with power. He has this power. He's going to be able to take this on. And so that is what they're getting introduced. They're kind of seeing Jesus this way. I mean, Jesus is in the Bible. That's the best way to see him is read him and just learn about him. But Jesus, God talks to us where we are quite often. He's going to reference it. And so he's talking to them where they are. And then he continues on with saying, this is who I am. You can make some reference here, but he says, I know your works. This is a city of works. They do work. They just work there. I know your works, and he goes on to say, I know your love, your faith, your service. I see all of this you're doing. If you just read through that one beginning introduction sentence, they sound like an amazing church. Because <laughs> he's he's. Uh, complimenting them. He's encouraging them on what they're doing and their love. Remember, Ephesus didn't have it. He's saying they have the faith, they have this endurance, which these other churches had. He's giving them a list of all these things that you seem to have. You're doing good. You're doing good, church. There's so much right there. But he says, I have this against you. I have this against you. And then he goes in to this thing, this that, he says, that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. So that, just to stop right there before I go any further, that's not saying that no women can be prophetess or that no women have a place of teaching or authority in the church. That's not what he's addressing. What he's saying here is, and I don't even know if her name is Jezebel or if he's making a reference to a name that they all connect out of the Old Testament. Because Jezebel, if you go back to the Old Testament, she was a queen from Crete, I think it was off of now that I'm thinking about it, that married an, uh, king in uh, Israel, and she basically tried to destroy their faith in God by bringing in idols and all this other worship and teaching all this other stuff. 
So maybe he's just referencing, maybe her name was actually Jezebel. It's not super important, but there's this lady in this church who's calling herself a prophetess, a prophetess, and she's teaching them all this stuff that isn't right. She's teaching people in this church to do this other stuff, this immorality, to eat food, sacrifice to idols, to be okay, just basically do a little bit, do a little bit. Similar to what we talked about last week with being distracted, the stumbling box, similar to that. But the thing is, is you, when you read that paired with the rest of the compliment he just gave the church, he's saying, so you, you're, as a church, you're doing all these works, you have faith, you have love, and, but you're also allowing this, which means they're kind of intermingled. This church is doing these things kind of together. That's the picture that's being pointed. It's not like the left side of the church is doing everything great and the right side of the church is doing everything awful. It's not like one side's doing one, the other side's just kind of like intermingled. One person might do a bunch of good stuff and then go do this and then go do a bunch of good stuff and then go do this. It's back and forth, which feels like humanity, I think, for most of us where we, we're doing good one day and the next day just feels like everything's falling out below us. But that's, kind of, that's the image that is being written here. That's the image, this church they're going along with some of these bad practices. Basically, they have work. Some of the stuff they're doing right, but some of their works also aren't good. And Jesus says, I gave her time to repent, which I think is a beautiful statement in itself. This is someone who's destroying, basically, the church slowly, and Jesus still is saying, I gave her time to repent, which gives us so much hope that Jesus is going to give us time to repent if we struggle, if we're slipping up, that he cares about us that much. He cares about us that much that he wants to bring us back. So he gave, Jesus is saying, I gave her time to repent. I gave her basically time to see what she's doing and how it's wrong. But then he follows it with says, but she refuses. But she refuses. And she's not just flat out saying, I don't understand. What do I need to repent of? She's just saying, no, I like what I'm doing. That's essentially what the picture that Jesus is pointing, painting here. And Jesus says, I will bring her, or bring judgment on her, essentially. He says, throw her on a sick bed. And, but basically saying, I will bring judgment on her and those who follow her. That's, that's essentially, we could break down line by line. And it says her children, which is really, from what we can see, basically an indication of the people that are following along under her. Her spiritual children, like the spiritual children, like the people that are listening to her teaching. He's like, I'm going to have to bring judgment on her. I'm going to have to address this with everyone who's going after this work, going after her. I'm going to bring this judgment. And it says throw on her sick bed. I don't know what that means. I don't know if he's just using that as a terminology. Maybe there was like a hospital guild there too or something, and so sick bed was a reference they know. I don't think it just meant that Jesus was going to make her sick for 10 days and then that was it. He's addressing this is going to be a serious issue. I'm going to bring judgment. I'm going to bring this. And he says, I'm going to do that. And all the churches all of the churches will know that I am he who searches the mind and heart. I am he that searches the mind and heart. And I will give to each of you according to his works or your works. And so this here is continuing, these two statements are continuing this picture of who they're talking to. Now, we can read it, and we can look at it just as the simple fact of, oh, Jesus is going to search our mind and hearts. But the, the purpose of the guilds, the purpose of the kind of culture that they had, is to review, study, and basically give a rating, a quality, to the works of that were coming out of their city. This is a culture that they understand. You say, you go to Thyatira Tire and say, I'm a quality inspector, basically. They know what that means. That's their culture. They, they were about quality. That's the point of these guilds. Quality, unity, bringing everything, having it all together. So Jesus is saying, 
yeah, you guys understand this. I'm the one who's going to come and search. I'm going to come and inspect. I'm going to search your mind and your heart. I'm not just going to see, oh, you made 40 pots today. Good job. No, I'm going to come and see, did you make 40 quality pots today? Basically, that's kind of the culture that they're, they're understanding. He's saying, I'm going to come and search it. I'm going to search what's actually in your mind and heart. I'm just not going to let it just look good. And not only that, I'm going to give you according to your works. Which, if you're doing everything good, yay! But he wasn't saying this in a sense that I'm rewarding you. He's saying, I know the quality of the work that you're putting out. He's saying, I, I see all your works at the beginning of this letter, at the beginning of this little introduction to this church, this edict letter. He says, I see your works. You have faith. You have love. You're doing these things. But I also see the quality of your works here. I see your quality of your works, and I'm going to give to each person in their church what they deserve. And he's letting them know that if you don't deserve stuff because you're just blah, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get just blah. And the people actually dedicated that are not going after these things are going to get according to their, their work. So this isn't, this isn't a good thing, basically, that Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you according to your works. He's saying he's bringing judgment with that statement. Because he says, he says in this letter, what you're learning what you're learning are basically the deep things of Satan. You're learning the deep things of Satan. There's basic sin. There's basic sins that we make. I mean, all sin separates us from God, but there are the sins that we make in our life. Like, imagine you're driving down the road and someone swerves at you and you have a moment of, like, anger and you're like, Argh! that's not, like, intentional hate at that person or intentional sinning. We have those kind of sins and we have to kind of review our lives and depend on God. But Jesus here is addressing these people that they know better. They know better, but they're purposely allowing this other stuff to come in and so they're giving out this icky stuff, this deep stuff that basically the kind of stuff that makes Satan happy. And so Jesus is addressing that. He's addressing this. And he even says after that, of which I also love, he says, to all the others in this church, to all the other Christians out there, basically, the ones of you that aren't doing this, I'm not going to lay extra burdens on you. You're doing great. You're doing great. If you're trying to pursue God, if you're trying to do this, and you're not gleefully taking in this evil, I'm not going to lay on your other burdens. Just keep holding on. You're doing great. That's the, from Jesus is saying to them, you're doing great. You're in this city. You're living life. The world is, is, can be awful at times. People are sinful. But if you're holding fast, you're believing me, you're doing great. Just keep holding on. I'm coming. He says, till I come, implying I'm coming. You're not just going to be there by yourself forever. And then he says, to the one who conquers... And to the one who keeps my works until the end. And I just, that really stuck out to me. Because if we read, if you go back and read all the other churches that we've read so far, it says, to the one who conquers, and then it says what he'll give or do. In this church, he says, to the one who conquers and who keeps my works. This is a church, he's talking to them about their works. He's saying, if you're conquering, how are, he's basically telling them how they're going to conquer. You're going to conquer by doing my works. Not your works, not the works of the world, but my works, what I value. Until the end, if you do that, either end of the world, end of your life, however the end that comes for us, if you do that, I will give him authority over the nations, which is a, is a promise to them that had impact. Because you, you remember at the beginning, I said this was a city that was marginalized. They didn't have power. You know, if you were in Pergamum, you could brag, yeah, I'm from Pergamum. If you're from Ephesus, yeah, I, I work in the capital. You have a certain level of like Rome cares about you a little bit more. That kind of stuff. This is 
Thyatira. They're kind of grinding out their own power and all that kind of stuff. They're trying to gain some as, as a culture, as a city. And Jesus is saying to the Christians in this church, this is what you see in the world, but know this. Jesus is saying, know this. I can give you this authority. All the authority you see people striving for on earth, the, people, the authority people are striving for in your city, no, if you follow me, I will give that kind of authority. I will give that kind of authority. It says he will rule them with a rod of iron. This is basically, you're, not that we're running around with basically bats beating people down, but the fact that there is solid authority. In their culture, you know, now we have steel and all that kind of stuff, but for them, iron was the top, most precious, hardest metal. So he's basically trying to tell them, basically the hardest, best, most powerful, sure thing that you can trust that is who I am. That's how you'll rule them. You'll have all this surety in me, with me. And then he says, when the earthen pots are broken in pieces, which is an interesting little phrase right there compared to the rest of it. And maybe he's just addressing some of the pottery that goes on in this place because I'm sure pots were bound to break once in a while and other stuff if they have potters and guilds and all that kind of stuff. But I'm reading this, what really stuck out to me and really drew my attention is I all of a sudden it just popped out to me of Gideon. So if you know the story of Gideon, Old Testament, one of the judges, the nation of Israel is being basically controlled and they were by a foreign power, and they're just being plundered constantly, and God raises up Gideon to bring basically earthly salvation, not like spiritual salvation, but salvation, basically freedom for the people. And he sends out the call and gets a large number of people, small compared to any army, but tens of thousands, and God whittles it all the way down to 300, and he's going to go take on this army, But what they do is they all carry lamps and a horn. And over their lamp, basically it says they have a pot covering the light. And when God reveals all of his glory, basically, through Gideon, through these 300, on the enemies, what they do, they smash these pots. They smash all these coverings. And the power of God basically overwhelms the enemy. That's the image of in the Old Testament. And so when I'm reading this and seeing the authority and what's going to happen at the end, that's what stuck out to me. And I want you to think about that. At the end, if we keep holding fast, if we're faithful, if we put out quality stuff, basically because we're dedicated in our hearts to God, at the end, when the earth and pots are broken, when the coverings, when everything is revealed, when Jesus is fully revealed to the world, all of this good stuff is going to happen. It's not, it's not at the end we're maybe going to win. It's not we're maybe going to win at the end. It's no, it is sure. It is already foretold. God has seen to it when the earthen pots are broken. And Jesus says, because I have already received this authority from my Father. It's not I'm hoping to get this authority from my Father. And then I'm hoping to give it to you. No, I already have it, and I'm giving it to you. And I will give him the morning star, which if you read the rest of the scriptures, basically the morning star is always a reference to Christ himself. The ruler and the rescuer. So basically Jesus is saying, and I'm going to give myself to you. I'm going to be your ruler and your rescuer. I'm going to rescue you in any situation. In any situation. And so Jesus is saying all this to this church in Thyatira. And essentially, as like, how how would I sum this up? Because we broke down these different passes. How would I sum this up? As if I was trying to explain what this little edict letter is about. And I come up with, as a church... They have works. It looks nice. They have these good things on the outside. You can see it. It looks like they're doing pretty good. So true for so many churches just throughout the world. But what is in the deep, the deep in their heart, a number 
of their people are corrupted in their hearts. If you get in deep, if you actually start looking and evaluating and looking at the quality and not just the image, you start looking at the quality, you see that there's a number of them with basically corrupted hearts. And so the work that they're putting out isn't quality. What they're doing isn't quality. And Jesus is making a statement that I don't just want quantity. I don't want you doing, running around busy crazy doing this, doing that, doing that, and just burning out and doing stupid things. Jesus is saying, I want to look at your very heart. I want to see quality coming from you. You don't have to do a lot. You don't have to do a ton of works, Jesus is saying. But I want your works, what you do, to be quality attached to me. I want the quality there. And so when we're looking at this, when we're, I'm thinking about this, I'm, th- I'm picturing these edict letters going out and what Jesus is saying to our church through these letters. And I, like I said earlier, there's the love aspect that we saw in Ephesus, this enduring faith aspect from these other cities, Smyrna and Philadelphia, and then Pergamum about the teaching and I'm seeing these, this story unfold, and I'm seeing if these are the core things, those other things that Jesus is saying to these churches, all of those come to the fact that they need works that match it accordingly. They, the works that we have need to be wrapped up basically in the faith, in the love, in the teaching, the knowledge. But so often we kind of just start doing things to do things, and we kind of don't have that. And so our works just turn into busyness. And humans, including myself, we're so good at busyness. We are so good at busyness. Just in our daily lives. And it's not wrong to be busy. It's not wrong to want to get together with friends and do all that kind of stuff. But when I see this, when I look at this and try to evaluate myself as a member of a church, I have to say, wow, are my works wrapped up in these other elements? Am I Come putting out quality works for Jesus. Am I putting out quality works for Jesus? If you want to throw up the, the slide for the chart for this church, I just want to recover this. I've done this every week, and I, I think this is really helpful for myself. I hope it is for you as well. So in this edict letter, the description of Jesus Christ was has eyes like a flame of fire, feet like burnished bronze, The commendation from Jesus was growing love, evidence of deeds of service. So they, like I said, they're they're doing stuff. It's good, but there's a rebuke for lack or lack of discernment, toleration of heresy. And then the next slide, the solution: hold fast and keep Christ's works until the end. Keep Christ's works, Jesus' works. The consequences for disobedience. Each is given their what their or as their works deserve. Given as their works deserve. And promise will be given the morning star and authority over the nations. And so when we read that, I just I want to say it one more time. When I read this, like if we don't keep Jesus at the center of it, if we don't look at this as Jesus talking to people he loves, he loves us so much, if we don't read it that way, it can be really depressing going, wow, it's dangerous to be in church because Jesus is judging his church and is really laying down the law. But it's not that at all. Because if we read it, not as someone who just kind of, eh, it's Jesus, and don't really care, but if we read it as, it's Jesus. It's God. He loves us. He's the one who is, Jesus is the one who is the faithful witness. Jesus is the one that's going to see us through this. Then when we read these edict letters, when we read this church in Thyatira, and we look at him talking about our works, instead of being like a judgment and condemning us, It can be a joy because we can see how God and Jesus is going to keep moving us through this. And it also points out the picture that if something bad is going on or you don't like, like you 
see something in the church or there's a church, maybe you hear in the news that some church did something wrong, something happened there. God isn't sitting there going, I don't care. We can see this and see that Jesus does care and that's not what he wants. What he wants us to be is dedicated to him and he is dedicated to us. Because his final promise was basically, I am going to give myself to you. Which he already gave himself for us on the cross. He already gave us salvation on the cross. But he says, I'm going to give myself to you. I'm going to keep giving myself to you. I'll continue to be your ruler and I'll continue to be your rescuer. Not only your savior, but your rescuer. I will rescue you. I will carry you. And when everything is in the world and you don't feel like it's going on, I will rescue you. Just do my works. Just follow me. Be deliberate, basically. Be deliberate in what you do. Be deliberate in how you think. And so with that, when I was earlier, when Laurel was up here talking about holy Holy, holy, holy. You know, sometimes uh, growing up as a kid, I kind of thought when people just started going holy, holy, holy in church, it was just kind of like a casual, you do it because, well, it's holy, whatever. But I've learned that if you're deliberate with what you're saying when you say holy and actually think about it, that's the kind of deliberateness that Jesus is looking for, is our deliberate worship to him, our deliberate dedication to him. We deliberately snuggle up to him, so to speak, in the bed and be close to him. We deliberately do something because Jesus wants us to do it. And that's how we keep his works. That's how we keep his works. I'm going to close us with prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, this morning I just, I want to thank you I want to thank you that even though reading these edict letters can be so tough at times, I also want to thank you that they're there. That now, thousands of years later, we can pick up this word and see an image, a glimpse, a view at how you're looking at the churches. Not that we read it and feel condemned, but that we can read it and see what you want so we have something to deliberately strive for. That we can go, oh, are we doing this or can we do better? So Heavenly Father, I thank you for that. And I just pray that this book is called Revelation. That I pray that we get a revelation from you. I pray this all the time that we receive a revelation, a new, a new insight, a new word in, to each of us individually. Through the Holy Spirit, because this is Jesus talking, but the clear introduction is coming from all of you, the all three persons, the Father, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, that you give us a revelation, that we know without a doubt you are dedicated to us. Because it's in there. You are dedicated to us. That's the whole point of the entire Bible, is your love for us. And so, Heavenly Father, ultimately, I pray over this church that each and every one of them, each and every individual here today, anyone that watches this at any point online or anything like that, that every individual would know just absolutely how much you love them. You love them and that Jesus has saved us and Jesus will rescue us. And that that is something that we can hold on to. And that is something that if we bury it in our hearts, we will know exactly where we stand with you, God. And we know exactly where we stand in eternity. And that is in your glory, being able to sing holy, holy, holy to you. We thank you so much for what we have. Please and help us not be blinded by what we don't have or think we don't have. But we thank you for what you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, clap for God.